All yeah. right, it looks like we're live. Welcome to Dive Into World Building, where, where, <laughs> where Paul has decided he's going to be in, in, in Nepal. <laughs> yes, yes, I did. <laughs> and, 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 and Kimberly's decided she's going to be in Finland. <laughs> 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 and the rest of us are either invisible or at home. <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> so in a, <clears throat> I'm going to admit that I had a really hard time motivating myself to come for this, for this show, but, but I was like, I'm going to just do this because I know that we will all feel better afterwards. <laughs> um, and so I was like, what do we talk about? Confinement. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so that gives us some excuses to just talk about our situation a little bit. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting to talk about um, confinement in a sort of a, a general sense. Um, and I don't necessarily mean imprisonment, but the kinds of traps and forms of confinement that we have um, to cope with sometimes, I think. Um, anything, anything is pretty much fair game. Um, so I guess we start with... Uh, What's it called in your state? <laughs> I think here it's called shelter in place. I don't think it's called lockdown. Is it called lockdown, Kimberly? It is not called lockdown. It's shelter in place for California. Yeah. Because that's a much nicer way of putting it. Well, the, I don't know what the, we're calling it in New York, but I do know that they're def, de, deliberately not calling it shelter in place because that's the term that apparently that we use for active shooters. Yeah, I was about to say that. Yeah, you know, I think we use that for active shooters too, and I think we, we also do. use it for like, like, don't go out of your house because everything's on fire. Yep, <laughs> right. And that's California yeah. has a lot of bad things happening. Just I, I, to, uh, <clears throat> sorry. Well, I mean, one blessing is one one odd blessing is that that um, the community actually has a lot of N95 masks just sort of sitting around in it because of the fires. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so people are donating them. And I know it's can't possibly be enough, but at least there's a lot. Like, I mean, like Google had a ton of, of masks yeah. that they donated because of um, having them for fires. Um, yeah, because the Google campus has like 15,000 <clears throat> employees there, right? Everyone's surprised at how big the numbers are, but, you know, the big tech companies have thousands of people mm -hmm. on site in any given location. So they're going to have, you know, tens of twenties of thousands worth of protective gear because they've got to have one, not only for the uh, full-time employees, but for the support staff as well and the part-time <clears throat> employees and the you know, they're, they're reasonable at making sure that they have, uh, you know, that, that they roll their part-time and temporary people into those numbers, which mm -hmm. is refreshing. That is nice. And I just remembered that one of my cousins uh, works for Google and has two very young children. And I have no idea what he's doing. If I'm assuming he's <laughs> working for home, from home now. Well, so how many of us actually work from home anyway? I just went to all the trouble of going to work for a big corporation so I don't have to work from home. And <laughs> that lasted about six months. Oh, wow. I mean, I was going out for my, for my part-time teaching job, but then I left that in February. So um, February, not this past February, but the previous year um, mm -hmm. so that I could work on my book stuff. And um, so I've been mostly working from home. Um, my husband is the one who's not used to it as much. I was uh, remote for three and a half to four <laughs> years before this job. And I was so excited to get started in the office. I just started my newest job February 10th. And it was like, oh, I got to see people for a minute. <laughs> Dang. I feel the exact same way. Yeah, well, that's because we always hung out. The times when we hung out in person were because I was flying all over the place. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Couldn't, couldn't, couldn't keep me away. <laughs> yeah, I would be, um, I, I would love to work from home. It would be great. I cannot work from home. Mm. Um, and 
arguably there are fewer people in my department and in the entire building than there are in my house. So it's sort of a trap, trap shoot, really. Um, so I called in the first two days of this week. I am calling in tomorrow and then I have to go in on Thursday. Um, but yeah, just, uh. I'm waiting on a lockdown from, or shelter in place, whatever you want to call it, from the governor. And I don't think we're going to get it because we started, I mean, we're Midwesterners. We don't talk to each other. We don't uh. touch each other. That's just nasty and don't, that's come on now. So uh, we yeah, started but yeah, I'm sure you're within six here. feet of each other. <laughs> yeah, I know. We try not to, though. Like, literally, when there is less than two feet of personal space, they consider the subway crowded. And like, who, I, what? Who are you? Um, so uh, we, we started flattening the curve here. We actually had um, fewer new cases today than we had yesterday. That's um, good. So... Yeah. It's good, but it also means that he may keep procrastinating, and at some point, that is going to go. It's going to spike, yeah. and then we're not going to understand why that happened. I would be screaming in my room, going, "But I get it! Oh my god, I was just..." Ah. So yeah, it's frustrating being a public health person right now. Yeah, yeah, I would say. Oh my gosh. Well, okay, so. Um... So to branch out from that into the into the sort of world building topic, I don't know. This is, I mean, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be relatively thematic level here. Um, being trapped is a huge uh, a huge theme for me, <laughs> um, and a great many of you have read my book, so you kind of probably know that. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. Um, people describe mazes of power as claustrophobic. <laughs> uh, well, well, I mean, I mean, you do lots of things, not only, not only on the thematic level, but it's like the whole idea of how you bind people in social structures, mm -hmm. which is a form of, which is a form of social confinement. Tom Alara is really tied up. <laughs> confinement. <laughs> yeah. Yes. And the way you design the maze, the, the mazes and the houses and the alleys and just, just how the entire city works is a exercise in underground claustrophobia. This is not this is not a book if you like wide open spaces and don't want don't like uh don't don't like to be pent up. It's it's it, it's sad by strips. Well, it is true. And 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 what's funny about it is that when I was first having the ideas, I had no idea that confinement was going to be such a theme i guess mm -hmm. but like there's a sure. lot of literal confinement and there's a lot of figurative confinement and like the whole city being underground is a form of confinement well and, and also the the whole like wearing gloves and not touching people is a whole yep. other set of confinement right mm. and I, I mean we, i think we understand better now yeah i mean, I mean <laughs> Just to mention your book one more time, even though it has nothing to do with this actual topic, the whole idea of the <laughs> theme of the disease, which is really relevant for these days, is you know, shot through your novel. You know, I didn't mean to do that. I really didn't. <laughs> but you did it. It's there. People are afraid of contagion in your book, for good reason. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. I think, I think if, you know, if you're wanting to go out and and read an interesting book right now. I, I would love for you to pick my book. If you're trying to avoid horrible contagion stuff, <laughs> you should buy my book because it doesn't even affect everybody. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I, and, and at least not, in your book, exactly everybody can stay. catch it. Hmm? Everybody can catch it, right. But only some people get really, really bad effects. And it's not a doomsday plague book. I no, it's not a book about a doomsday plague. There happens to be a. But you know, but I think it's worth I think it's worth noting while we're on this topic that the Grobel are confined. Yes. As a class, they're genetically in a box, and that box is called the decline, and they are not willing to take the steps that it would take to get out of that box. So. Well, that, you know, feeding into the larger idea of this discussion, right, con confinement takes a lot of different forms. It's not yes, just, 
being trapped in a physical space or being underground or being in a spaceship or, you know, a car trapped at the bottom of the lake. It's, you know, it's, it, it can be a social or societal confinement, right? Mm -hmm. You're, you know, trapped within your own social strata or trapped within your own uh, idea of, of the norms you need to meet, right? Yep. Trapped in a family situation, like say a marriage that you don't want to be in, but for societal or personal reasons, you're stuck in like it or not. Yeah. yeah. Yep, that's happening in there too. <laughs> So. Or trapped in a world he never made, Howard the Duck. There you go. In an alternate <laughs> universe where it's like apes that became the sentient species and not ducks. So <laughs> that was the whole thing. Uh, but uh, has anyone read the wonderful novel Solitaire by Kelly Eskridge, Convicted of a Crime? And her sentence is uh, several years in a virtual reality solitary confinement prison cell. Uh, so I have she's not put into a, like a medical. I'm sorry, Cliff. I think we I lost know. you. Yeah, his uh, internet's his internet has frozen him. <laughs> yep. It sounds very Matrix-like, however. It does. It does really. Um, yeah, though, I mean, he got got by robots. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, I don't know enough about the book, unfortunately, but it sounds very interesting. Um, <clears throat> Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. I don't have video, but um, yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it is. Uh, it was made into a movie, but the movie was a loose adaptation. But the, the, the question of confinement, there was a couple of levels of confinement, right? She was confined to a virtual reality and she was confined to a single room in that virtual reality, although the virtual reality was bigger than that single room. So, ah. um, and then she was also in a way confined to her own mind because the VR was happening in her own mind. When did this when did this come out? Um, let me look it up. That sounds Three like years. cell, doesn't it? Well, it, it just I was thinking of uh, that old Deep Space 9 episode. Oh, that one. Gosh, where, the one with the bleeding uh, temple thing. Where O'Brien uh, gets put under uh, like a VR he goes to like VR solitary for like 10 minutes. But in his mind, it's been like 14 years. Yeah. Oh, that's like, a different one. And he comes out all super PTSD. Got... And it's pretty messed up. And it kind of, it kind of is, is you know, it, it, that, that whole question of like, hey, it's not okay to just do something to somebody because it's just their brain. <laughs> that's yeah, still yeah. torture. Well, and they did this in, in um... Demolition Man. And they did this in, and this shows up in Altered Carbon as well. You know, when, when the body is confined, is it better to let somebody's mind wander around in a construct so they don't go completely off their nut? <clears throat> the answer is, of course, everybody goes completely off their nut anyway. Uh, <laughs> it, it, in Solitaire, which was 2002, published in 2002, um, in Solitaire, designed to go completely nuts because the VR is a room. You're stuck in a solitary confinement cell for years. Not even like modern solitary confinement where you're only trapped 23 hours a day and are allowed to go into a, you know, a prison yard for one hour where you can see sky but no trees or anything, right? right, you're, right. Not even, you're not even granted that. That's you're actually a deliberate room, portion. 24 hours a day. Well, yeah, that's the point of it. Is it's a well, I mean, so, regular torture. solitary confinement is also deliberate torture. Yes. Yes. But yes. This, oh, there. <laughs> um, but this is uh, this is even harsher, right? Ugh. And it was presented as humane because the VR sped up time perception, so that you were like you were in the VR for like three years of real time, but it felt like 15 years or something along those lines. So you come out of it three years later, but you're bonkers because you've just been in a room for 15 years, you know, 
Well, so. I mean, okay. I have objections, but, but I, think, not sure I think that I... was probably the point of the book. The point <laughs> more of the book humane. was that this was not a humane way of dealing with criminals, yes. <laughs> that was one of the major themes of the book. But it was about being trapped, because even before our protagonist is in the environment, she is raised by a corporation on an island owned by the corporation. Her parents are employees of the corporation. Everyone on the island is an employee. She's an employee. Everyone that she grew up with has to work for this corporation because the corporation owns them, essentially. Right? There's no choosing a job. So there's a confinement there. Yeah. Literally on an island. Literally one corporation. And then, you know, so she has to kind of, this character has to navigate different sort of shells of confinement yeah um and it's it's a bit like uh those russian dolls yeah, uh, yeah yeah so anyway it's a really good book solitaire by kelly Eskridge. there there's a netflix mini series called the i dash land which is about a bunch of criminals stuck in a vr construct where they're like on this desert island and one of the one of the, one of the one of the convicts figures a way to get out and gets thrown back in again. It's 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 it does more with drama than actually exploring the concept, but it's the whole idea again of dealing with prisoners and a by basically confining them mentally, and it's sure. not, it's not pleasant. It as as Alex says, it's still torture. Right. Yeah, and any prison drama like Oz, right, is going to be about confinement. Um, and then, yeah. well, uh, I don't know if you those. saw, um, the, the astronaut, one of the twin astronauts, Kelly, I forget what is, is Mark Kelly, I think yeah. he wrote an op-ed for the New York times about what it's like to be in a tin can or a bunch of tin cans for like a year and not be able to walk outside because it's outer space yeah. you know, and how to deal with confinement. Uh, that's, that's a great primary source for yep. science fiction writers. A whole essay by an astronaut who lived in space for a year about what it's like to live in space for a year. I think it's and Scott Kelly. From that. Is it? Scott, okay. There's two of Scott. them, They're identical. Yeah, I know, I know, I feel so yeah. bad. Like I actually shared an email with Scott Kelly. Uh, uh, a, guy, a guy I knew knew him and was like, you know, hey, he would totally critique your ship landing scene in Alien. So I like <laughs> extended the scene so that astronaut could Scott Kelly could read it, and then uh, and then uh, he 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 read it and then never got back to me. So it must have been mind blowingly good. I'm sure uh, he's he's a busy guy. He's a uh, he's an astronaut. I was just excited to trade emails with him. <laughs> sure. I've met a few astronauts and got my picture taken with them, and that was exciting. So. Yeah. There we go. I'm sorry. I'm not contributing here at all. Okay. So, like, I feel like a, I feel like an environment of claustrophobia. Uh, you know that that in. Uh oh, I'm, I'm getting it. Uh, yeah, but I, I feel like uh, you can you can create kind of that emotional confinement pretty well by yeah you know through things like mistrust and things like that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. and. Of course, you know, in your books, you've got you've got built in reasons not to trust people. Right. Mm -hmm. um, which I guess that's true. of. I guess that's probably true of any culture, actually, that exists out there. That, mm -hmm. You know, people are going to perceive built in reasons not to trust people. But, uh, you know, in yours, you have an explicit caste system. Right. So, yeah. you know, uh, it seems to me that. Yeah, I mean, I guess we already covered this one. <laughs> well, I mean, OK, so so. Um... The idea of not trusting people because they're not a part of your group is definitely a thing. Um, sure. I also think I also think one of the other things that I try to deal with, at least, is the sense that individuals are confined by the ideals that they are supposed to hold and the identity that they are supposed to conform to. Mm. Yeah, um, that was the reason I posted um, our call, like Ryan and Gilman. It's um, and Juliet, if you haven't read it, it's positing a future Japanese civilization oh, cool. at the bottom of a rift in an ocean planet. And they're living in these little habitats and then along a seam in the planet that's um, volcanic, that they have stationary habitats. And so there's yeah. this 
ultra uh, complex culture that's driven up around this. And this is a person who hasn't managed to find a mate and hasn't managed to do the things the culture wants her to do. And she's sort of settled with her grandmother and trying to keep doing the things she needed to do. It's a really, really good story. And it has a lot to do with like what happens in an insular culture when you have an injection of something that is not of it. So in group, out group and learning or not and conflict and but all of it in this little tiny thing. And it, it yeah, it's really good. That's very interesting. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, and what do you do when, when the expectations for your behavior are not consistent with the things that happen to you? <laughs> I don't know. I'm always, yeah, I mean, I just think that um, this is going to be, this is going to be another 10 seconds advertisement for the idea that people should not ever run true to type in fiction, that you should not ever say, I am an elf and therefore I behave like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I feel like there's a certain, certain group of writers that really enjoyed writing broad swaths of people the exact same way. I don't know what it is about those old, older writers that maybe, anyway. <laughs> hey, Elric was a game changer. <laughs> Sorry, was that you, Kimberly? Huh? I said Elric was a game changer. <laughs> oh, hell yeah. The <laughs> yeah. Love Elric. Um, there was, uh, I wanted to say there was a science fiction book by Bob Silverberg called The World Inside, um, which posited a future Earth where there were two parts of society. The farmers who lived in a kind of like uh, low tech, relatively low tech environment, and then urban monads, which were gigantic towers, like halls where people lived. And they sacrificed nearly all their freedoms for like complete sexual freedom. Um, however, there were some limitations to the imagination of the author in this regard, because for example, everyone was straight. Um, so, <laughs> uh, but uh, nonetheless, it was to me when I was like uh, 14, when I was reading it, it was very fascinating. <laughs> it was, uh, I got some new concepts there from that book. But anyway, it was um, an interesting uh, Gedanken experiment, the world inside, because it was like, well, what happens if I take away all these freedoms, but amp up this other freedom for my characters? And they couldn't leave. It's like illegal for them to leave their monad. Mm. And then the colony on Venus, where some people came, and the Venusians had, ironically, relative freedom. They could travel all over Venus in their underground cities or whatever. Yeah. They could go to Earth and back. But the people in the monads they visited could not leave their home monad. If you were born, lived, and died in your monad. What about uh, confinement through openness? Like, for instance, surveillance states. <clears throat> so those become emotionally confining and destructive to the to the to the community by virtue of the way that they observe everything you can go anywhere but we're always being watched exactly right. and well, and you yeah, or or a literal stand-in for societal expectation in in a way well you know i i, I guess you know on the one hand i, I want to say that it's allegorical on the other hand i want to say that you know east germany existed well yeah yeah, yeah. you know like <laughs> well you have these um Sorry, I don't mean to say that it's allegorical. I mean to actually say that that you get the this sort of uh, authoritarian command that comes down and it becomes a sort of societal expectation game of oh, definitely. mutual surveillance. I guess that's what I was trying to say and did it badly. <laughs> no, no, I'm so sorry. That that wasn't I. Now I feel terrible. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see what you mean. And I, I think that, uh, you know, kind of to your point, it's always the, it's the people that uh, choose to go along with that system that, you know, kind of create those rifts, mm. you know? Uh, and so there has to be, there has to be kind of a destruction of the, a breakdown of the interconnectedness of a community in order for an authoritarian system to work. And, Ooh, and so how do you do that? Well, the first thing you do is you start creating systems where you judge communities. 
And, and and so you know I, I think that uh, you know and so yeah you've got you know your 1984s and stuff like that you've also got your more recent like Black Mirror where it talks about the social currency, right? That China then went on to be like oh that's a great idea you know <laughs> like yeah um, I I always uh, I, I'm having trouble I'm feeling confined as a writer right now because I'm having trouble outstripping the evil <laughs> yeah. seriously. I feel like I just, I can't, it's hard to keep up. Well, yeah. Well, like, uh, I'm pretty sure that someone along the lines of Donald Trump is in charge of Waylon Yutani. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, right? no, the, someone in charge of Waylon Yutani is in charge of somebody like Donald Trump. Come on now, you know how that works. <laughs> he didn't get he didn't get to the top of Waylon Yutani, you know, <laughs> writing checks and going bankrupt. Come on now. <laughs> I don't know. He can't. He isn't doing any worse than Burke. Anyway. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, they always do. say that they always say that reality is stranger than fiction. Well, I mean, I would like to think that there have been several novels who had a villain very much like the current resident. And they were rejected as being completely unbelievable. Yeah. yeah. And there are people like screaming at their agent, you know, I cannot believe. So, yeah. I mean, because I have one in the can, that, or not in the can, it's still in my head, but I'm working on the can part um, that, you know, posits white supremacists, you know, rising up and taking over the US. And I'm like, and I didn't even want to call it a boogaloo. Oh. <laughs> so you know yeah we've got all this stuff that people are like oh like, that could never happen we're not going to buy that and then it happens and they're like well i didn't know <laughs> like, well clearly well, okay. i did <laughs> so so i think one of the things that we're looking at here is there is a sort of um confinement by expectation yeah um and those expectations are set up by traditional narratives Sure. Yeah. But, yeah. you know, it, it goes even, you know, a little harder, right? When you think about all of the fiction that is out there and all of the dystopian scenarios where, you know, the government puts the state on lockdown and people lose their shit and go riot in the streets and burn down the supermarkets. And, you know, the there is a, a very clear and well-defined difference between historical examples to things like large-scale confinement and the way we look at those in in our fiction and our media and our storytelling <clears throat> right our our stories are designed to be more interesting uh, and so you you can get false narratives that people you know can either lean into or lean away from i have a whole cadre of friends who are breaking out their apocalypse gear and going to the supermarket for a lark um acknowledging the difference in these kinds of narratives um, yeah um and it, and you can definitely see what kind of narrative people are holding on to or sort of seizing right now mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, 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 do, I do have a special place in my heart for the narratives that uh, choose not to address that um, through, well, I, I guess I should really say like that, that aren't like, oh, you're, you're, you're the chosen one, you're here to bring us out of this, mm. right? You know, stories, stories that center around that uh, particular element i find i you know i i wonder did, yeah did, did we cover the confinement of popularity must be awfully lonely being the chosen one or something oh um, mm, well i don't think we've touched on it but it it fits you know with a lot of these scenarios we've been describing right confinement via expectations you know everybody mm -hmm. has a certain model in their mind of what a chosen one is like and what their role is I did and like Cisco is... as the emissary in DS9, for example. Yes, that was so great. <laughs> yeah. How he like clearly didn't want the job and like hated it. <laughs> and resisted it all the way up until the end where he finally starts. Re right. oh, he, really he lost it to another guy one time, remember? Uh, so, oh, yeah, and that that's guy right. ended up being like a fundamentalist monster. <laughs> mm. 
<clears throat> yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. So I'm I'm also gonna say that that um that somebody who's very, very famous is also confined by a lack of ability to form personal connections because of because of something. Or 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 even or even like just doing some of the things we take for granted. Like for example, Neil Gaiman, who lives just over the border in Wisconsin, could never come to say Convergence, a big convention here in Minneapolis every summer because he would get mobbed. Right. I mean, I, I can go there and 30 people know you or Neil Gaiman would just get absolutely swarmed. He can't do that because- What are you talking about, Paul? You're amazing. <laughs> I can't even believe I'm on this chat with you. <laughs> We're all You're here kind, with Alex. Great Paul Weimer. <laughs> You're the greatest. I'm a, yeah, I'm a we, Paul, we've Paul all stand. We, we, we've been all trying to pretend like we're not in awe constantly. So it's just, yeah, it's it's tough. Well, it's he's in effort. the exact center of my screen. I don't know about the rest of you clowns. <laughs> <laughs> so I keep thinking about a story by E.M. Forster called "The Machine Stops." Stops. Oh yeah. In which everyone in a society is in a room, their lives, their whole lives, individually interacting through video chats and stuff like that from 111 years ago. Wow. <laughs> it was like, you know. Um, <laughs> oh, God. Yeah, right. It's like the proto matrix, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you know, because the matrix had the, the idea that everybody was confined, right? They were in these pods. Yeah. So mm -hmm. that's yeah. that's one of the things that I think is so odd about this this confinement and the, the, the impact that it's had on all of us because I mean there are a lot of sci-fi writers that now get to be like I knew it I knew something like this would happen right there are a whole bunch of them that that have that have nailed a couple of aspects of this pretty pretty darn well yeah you know I, I feel like I got like the, the 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 mildest version of that because of because of the you know, American Iranian tension that I modeled in my latest alien book. And it was like, you know, it, it, the announcement happened right after the, the thing hit. And it was like, yeah, uh, this has been in the works for over a year. Um, <laughs> like, I don't know what to tell you. Like, it, you don't have to throw a rock and you, you'll hit this, this, well, it's this kind of problem. There are a lot of authors who have epidemic narratives out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> me being one but like um mike chen uh a beginning at the end is another um where you know we wrote these things ages ago <laughs> and right. it just happens to be coincidence that they're both out now but like everybody who's reading them feels like it's concurrent and it's like oh this connection this thing and you know what even even before so like even before we were all in the position we are now, where we're all like, we were confined because of this epidemic. People were already saying, wow, what an interesting, what an interesting convergence that you have this epidemic in your book, Juliet. And also there's this epidemic going on in China. And I'm going, well, yeah, that's pretty interesting. And we got more interesting. So yeah. I guess they are a third of the world's population after all. Yikes. Or now they, they, but they, they represent a substantial thing. There's nothing that happens just in China. Yeah. That's <laughs> what an odd statement, an epidemic just in China. Wrong. <laughs> now, if it was just in Greenland, we'd cut them off like Plague Inc. <laughs> <laughs> I am very frustrated with that game right now. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, I like that they have the, they, in, they introduced a cure mode. Have yeah. you seen it? Oh, yep. that's so great of them. Thank goodness. What There's a whole bunch of weird thing. modes that I didn't see before when I was playing it, you know, a decade ago. So, yeah. Yeah, um, they've continued it. I, I have. And they've I done may. a really good job. The Brexit stuff is hysterical. Oh, yeah. <laughs> if, if, <clears throat> if I may ask, uh, and I didn't mean to interrupt you, Kate. I, I apologize. No, good. Uh, I would like to hear about how maybe some of your characters have broken confinements. Or 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 mm. at least lessened the hold over themselves. You know, something something that I mean. You know, we talk about how our characters experience confinement in their books, and 
uh, I would like to hear from some of you other authors about, you know, how do your characters get out of that? How do they, how do they, how do they feel less sad about it? <clears throat> oh no. So <laughs> I, I, I don't want everybody else to go first. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go with the caveat that I'm talking about a book that I finished and haven't sold yet. So hey, it's making no, this is great. So, so I've, I, I Inside have baseball. a solution, but I don't know whether it works because no editor has bought it yet. Um, oh, no. Although early days, early days shopping it around. So, you know, um, but I have a protagonist who winds up in an oubliette for several chapters. <laughs> and this is probably a terrible idea. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I had to figure out ways to, to for the character to stay sane, but I also had to figure out ways for the reader to stay engaged because the character was not physically moving. Mm. And there are a couple of chapters before she really communicates with her jailers uh, who are not human. And so um, she has, uh, what I did was uh, she started hallucinating. And uh, that is a uh, product research i did in, in um well, great cliff what else can i do though right well you know, <laughs> starts having conversations with hallucinations right so there's that i also used a flashback so there's one chapter with a flashback and then i gave her tasks to do in her confinement um like the aliens that are are confining her don't really understand that humans pretty much prefer their food dead and cooked <laughs> not large, armed, armored, and trying not to get eaten. Um, so there's a whole chapter where she tries to eat <laughs> because the oh. the, the uh, basically the um, roughly I don't know three foot long arthropod that they dumped in her cell as lunch uh, is in fact um, has very sharp razor sharp claws. Um, it has armor that, you know, deflects her one knife pretty effectively. And the, uh, they're in pitch darkness, so she has to try and hunt this thing and so that she doesn't starve to death. Um, so that's kind of, that's a chapter right there. <laughs> <laughs> it's a real so, lighthearted yeah. romp. I love it. <laughs> um, yeah. And the one thing I do, I mean, my book is, it, there's a lot of challenges faced by my protagonist, but plague is not one of them. <laughs> oh no! So, I feel like if you have a knife fight with a three-foot arthropod, like God, you have everything. How did you miss plague? <laughs> oh, I, miss it. I, I addressed it. So everyone, uh, because they're they're doing space exploration, humans have little nanobots in their uh, bloodstream, whose job it is to uh, to try and isolate and kill exo germs exo microbes right so you land on a new planet how do you deal with the micro fauna of that planet is you have these little nanobots in your bloodstream that are kind of standard issue for all citizens and they either deal with it or they don't the, the joy of it though is that she doesn't know whether her nanobots are going to work on this new planet dun, she's dun, like dun. Stuck, stuck there and it's like and it's like this it's the waiting game like you know 14 days of of potential incubation on COVID, it's like, well, she's in there for a couple of weeks, and will the nanobots keep her from getting sick? Mm. Mm. <laughs> it's a waiting game. It's like okay, well, so, um, so I had an idea. <laughs> this is actually something that I mentioned. Um, I feel like it's super recent because I just wrote the, the report um, this morning. <laughs> that tells you how far behind I am. But, um, but this was an interesting question for me because I was dealing with the question of Lady Tamalera, who is a very confined person, um, but not a weak person. Um, and I wanted to make sure that she came across as, as powerful as she was, um, though she was very confined. And so um, my, my stealth maneuver, which, you know, I guess this is a spoiler, but it's not really a spoiler because it's not really a direct plot spoiler. Um, is that that Tamlera decides that that because of the epidemic, she's going to wear gloves and she's going to have her son wear gloves too. 
Um, and then, um, so sh what she does is she innovates and she does art and she does fashion. And those are things that she's allowed within her space. Um, but then those things end up expanding outwards um, and being more influential than everybody's expecting. So by the end of the book, everybody's wearing gloves um, because she and her servant had this idea right at the beginning and it was a really good idea. And everybody was like, oh, we should do that. Um, but nobody kind of noticed that that was her making it happen, right? And yet this is a pretty major victory for her influencing the space outside of her confinement. Um, so there's that. And, um, and there's also something else that she's done, which is that she, um, and this is kind of like a peek ahead. She's actually had a permanent influence on the place where she uh, was taken off to and lived in confinement for five years. Um, and so she has had a permanent effect on the city of Salimna that she's not even aware that she had, um, but you discover that uh, in book two. I was thinking about that. I mean, she goes from Salimna and away from her husband, but in the confinement of, of a different sort into back into her husband's household and into a different kind of guy. So she goes from one to the other. Yeah, in the book, yeah. At the beginning of the book. Yeah, so, so, um, so you're going to see what she did when she was in Salimna. Um, which is kind of fun. And I was like, ah, she's, been, she's done it again. <laughs> like, this is like obviously get, become a pet project for me is like, what has Tamalera done to influence things around her while she's, she's still being confined and, and still being perceived as um, not an influential person. You mean like showing her son the surface? Sorry? Like so, showing her son the surface briefly? Oh, yeah, like that. <laughs> yeah, like that. Like that. <laughs> Yeah, she's got some ideas, that's for sure. Well, I've read a number of um, sort of medieval fantasies and things in which uh, there was a female protagonist, royal born, who doesn't want to sit and do needlepoint and sew mm. all day as, you know, upper class girls were supposed to learn how to do and wanted to like play with swords and things like that, mm -hmm. like her brothers. And so... Uh, there's that kind of um, confinement of gender roles mm -hmm. and gender expectations that also have to do with class, right? Yeah. Like in some ways, the peasant women were, were freer than she was because she had to sit in this room with this adult woman, you know, getting her and her cousins and whatever ladies in waiting to sit there and do needlepoint all day. It's boring. Mm -hmm. Well, I, so though, now that I'm, I'm, I'm listening to that in the, the all day part. It doesn't matter what you're doing, whether it's it's sword play or needlepoint, to do it all day, literally. For well, for hours a day anyway, right? Yeah, and then that it, it's not even going into like foot binding, which is oh, another yeah, kind well, like of confinement. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Can't even run around ever, or or, or, or like confinement of clothes, like kimonos or corsets, and mm -hmm. well, that, that takes us back to the underwear. <laughs> that takes us back to the underwear. Sorry, Juliet. <laughs> so so honestly, I love, I love speaking back to that because that was one of our best ever. <laughs> I have to I have to watch that. I, but I I'm, um, I'm in the middle of writing the report, Morgan. So oh, good, 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 good. <laughs> but yeah. Um, yeah, but but other, I mean, not foot binding, but we're confinement, uh, and I guess we've, we've been covering this. But the clothes that you wear uh, are are a social, mm, yeah, social thing, not just you know the ones that are physically restrictive, like high heels. Yeah. Um, yep, high heels started with men, but then men ditched them. And so. and for good Space reason, suits. And, and we should do. We should, you know. I I don't know. I don't like them. Space suits and still suits. Space suits, suits are quite confining. Yeah. Yes, but that's the problem, actually. If you didn't have them, 
Oh, well, that's a good point. Uh, you know, you won't, yeah. you don't want to be free of your spacesuit necessarily. Yeah. So, <laughs> space. so that's, you know, look at it. What is, well, I mean, there's the a alternative. Sort of, there's a sort of a sense of, ah, uh, sorry. I just had a moment. Kimberly, weren't we just talking about this? <laughs> the mm -hmm. idea that your home could be a safe space and also a trap. Yes, <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, certainly, certainly one of the reasons, like Alien doesn't work very well as a story, or it's hard to work it as a story uh, if you want to uh, have it on the open surface of the world where transportation is easy and all of your friends are nearby. <laughs> like, <laughs> that, that moves it from science fiction to total fantasy. Right. Well, <laughs> that's that's a good point. But, uh, you know, but if you can, um, but if you can get around really easily. Uh, you know, of course, it, it changes things, right? So if you can exit, it, you know, it's important that that that, that there's a, a labyrinthine sense. It feels like that's part of what people sign up for, you know, um, kind of like the alien has to be in there. Also, you need to be confined to a small space that is shrinking by the minute. Well, and then, you know what, the other thing that is very common is that this the romance trope of being confined with somebody who you're end, going to end up having a love relationship with. The, there oh, is only yes. one bed. There's only <laughs> one bed. <laughs> oh, yes. But the gentleman will take the couch in those. Stories. I think it's oh. called forced marriage. Hmm. Is that is that what it's called, that trope? That is a terrible name for the trope. <laughs> but not totally wrong. <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. So speaking of which, there's speaking of no exit, there's no exit by Chartres, which is hell is other people, right? Being confined right. for two people you're not going to get along with. Well, and you know what? I think that's one of the things in the good place as well. Trapped with these four people forever to torture you. Right. Oh, hopefully we didn't spoil. I mean, yeah, this, this show's over. Hopefully we didn't spoil for people. I the good place yet. <laughs> okay, yeah, whatever you have to figure it out by now. The building is full of spoilers. <laughs> I know, but, you know, I just feel sensitive. Well, it's after five, you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> and we are confined to one hour only. On this right, podcast. right. We're <laughs> totally confined to one hour. <laughs> But I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to thank you all for being here and I'm going to take us off of YouTube and then we can continue to converse. Um, anybody who is listening uh, next week, we are going to be having um, a guest and let me just make sure my brain is working. Uh, it should be, but um, I want to make sure that I am not giving you bad information here. We're going to have Shiv Ramdas on the sh on the show, um, and he has a story that has been nominated for a Nebula um, called "And Now His Lordship Is Laughing." And so we're going to talk to him about his uh, story and his work, and that should be really cool. And um, yeah, I hope that you can be here for it. Um, but for now, thank you all for being here and I'm gonna take us off the air. All right.